There you go. Oh, perfect, good. So uh, as I was putting together this talk, this is one of my favorite quotes. The longer our trail of regress, the more we tend to value the importance of making wise decisions. And this was, uh, it turns out, you know, again, I've, I've heard this quote many years ago, and Bob Santos, turns out, so Seattle uh, native. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he uh, was apparently a minority rights advocate back in the 70s and 80s. So it's a wonderful quote that kind of uh, fits into our topic of discussion tonight. So, um, is it possible for me to stand so I can look at it as I okay. be the easier? Monitors, you can look at the monitors. Oh, there we go, okay. Even though it's really hard. Okay, so this uh, patient is uh, a 73-year-old lady that I've uh, taken care of now for um, more than nine years. She came to me nine years ago at the time she was having a fair amount of neck pain, was having uh, kind of a typical you know, a pain that wasn't just, you know, midline, but also kind of off to one side, starting at the top of her neck, coming down just to the top of the shoulder. But we managed her for a number of years conservatively, and about six years ago, uh, it got to the point where she really had a hard time living with it. So I ended up fusing her, and you can see that's the middle slide. One month post-op, she ended up having single level fusion at C3-4. Six months post-op, she looks good. One year post-op, she looks good. Um, and then uh, 18 months post-op. So again, even with fusion patients, I continue to follow them. Uh, but in this case, this patient came back to me about four years out. And you can see she has gone on to autofuse the C4-5 level. Uh, she was having quite a bit of trouble at 5-6 and 6-7 levels. So, uh, you know, for, for the second surgery, which was right around four years ago or so, I ended up uh, replacing the two levels below. Uh, again, uh, clearly off-label on many, many different levels here. Uh, post-op release, she did wonderfully. You can see her x-rays at one month post-op. You can see them at six months post-op. Even between the difference between one month and six month, uh, you know, at that uh, C5, six level, you start seeing a bit of a spondylolisthesis that's taking place. Again, patient at that point in time can do very well. Uh, I've kind of moved some of the slides over to the left side of this picture here. Six months post-op, nine months post-op, and then 15 months post-op. So uh, uh, Rick or Jack or, uh, or Jens, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I, I think we've discussed this in our quarterly arthroplasty uh, uh, symposium. You're such a great contributor always. Um, I'm worried that we're too unsophisticated in the understanding of the biomechanical subtleties of some of our implants relative to the connective tissue um, functions on the patient. And we may add a little bit to that. You're a master. Your x-rays always look beautiful. Your cases are well selected. And I've seen some of your patients are very happy. So I, I would personally attribute that to the implant uh, mechanics in this particular patient relative to the soft tissue um, tightness. And uh, uh, with that, I specifically mean the collagen uh, tension uh, uh, resistance in this particular patient. What about you, Jack or Scott? What what are your some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think you have a, a big lever arm above arm, and there's there's not much motion even at C two three, but certainly you know it's a big immobile segment above that, and you have a disc that has a, a hypermobility <laughs> potential to it. Sure. So uh, you know, I just think it's just been progressively overloaded. Uh, over time, and it's exceeded the manufacturer's recommended. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, again, uh, obviously, you know, in the patient who I felt like, you know, because the jump would have been go from two level fusion to four level fusion, which happens not infrequently, I guess, in uh, in the spinal surgical world. Uh, but uh, you know, my uh, I guess intent as well as uh, wish and uh, goal was to see if I can maintain some of the motion. So at at least. At that point in time, when I did the surgery, I felt like, hey, this looks great. Very quickly, within basically year and a, less than a year and a half, it kind of moved on to where it looks like this. Yes, Scott. Can I ask a question? And that is, um, given all of our experience, and a lot of us have done a lot of Mobis, and I've done them next to fusions before, that that hasn't happened to, in addition to the biomechanics that, that was brought up by Jens and Jack, could there be some patient factors there? Because I mean, look at, at the third surgery one, look at her facet joint. I mean, is, is, is there some posterior instability that Bingo. maybe just made it fail Bingo. The, Bingo. that might make that next, next yeah. disc fail? Bingo, 100%. So again, the, the part of this kind of uh, how this fits into this, I wish I hadn't. I, I really, I, I, I wouldn't say I wish I hadn't done the first surgery, which is the two-level Moby. 
it's like I wish I hadn't done the, I guess what would be the third surgery, which I failed to recognize that this wasn't, at least at this point in time, I kind of blamed the disc to some degree, right? I blamed the mechanics of the disc, and I failed to recognize what I think is happening is facet incompetence, whether it's capsular, whether it's joint, that I just did not recognize that. So I feel like in this type of a situation, because of a large level arm, because of uh, kind of native tissue incompetence, right? Uh, and I don't think it's a bone issue, I, because I did check this patient's bone density, so her bone density is fine. This is not a failure to kind of, uh, uh, you know, attach to the bone, but this is my failure in recognizing what was going on here biomechanically that wasn't just disc-related, as we kind of tend to sometimes say, well, it's a, it's a MOBC, it's a hypermobile disc. And I ended up, well, if I was going to revise her, I ended up revising both levels to, uh, to M6, so this is what it looked like with the third surgery. At time of surgery, looks great. Again, patient has good relief. One month post-op looks great. Two months post-op, as you can see, as we go on to nine months post-op, basically because of continued, you know, uh, intrinsic mechanical issue related to patient's spine itself, the disc never, never osteointegrated, so it started slipping forward because the facets are incompetent. At least that's the way, at this point in time, I interpreted things. and. And again, going back to, I wish I hadn't done this and had gone on to, you know, do something at that uh, C5-6 level from the MOBC instead of going from MOBC to an M6, and then seeing this failure, which then kind of led to next so, surgery. So we have about five minutes. So Michael Longley, uh, uh, Charlotte, he he also felt that this was just too long of a lever arm. Frank, before Armin goes on, you had your hand raised. Me. <laughs> yeah, Frank. You're live. Otherwise, yeah, no, I did not mean to raise my okay. hand. That's Never mind. Like, okay. Uh, having a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Armin, carry on. So, uh, again, patient started having recurrent neck pain again, and this was, again, progressing. It's, it's one thing, you know, I tend to manage most of my patients who have some degree of postoperative neck pain uh, very, very conservatively, but I think the ones that are progressing and getting to the point where it's becoming, uh, you know, uncomfortable enough for them where they're starting to ask for something more than just a you know, uh, non-opioid. Non uh, so once, once they get to the point where they're asking for opioids, then certainly I, I take that a bit more seriously, especially in a patient that I've known for nearly 10 years. So this patient, I ended up taking her back, taking out the M6 and uh, placing in a fusion implant. And I think at least if, uh, I think what you uh, pointed out, Scott, kind of the facet gapping as well as what appeared to be incompetent tissue or uh, structure there, was certainly present at C5-6. I think C6-7 is looks better, and uh, we're only three months post-op, so uh, <laughs> gosh, I really hope I'm, I don't have to go back for a fifth time, because that would be one of those true, I wish I hadn't cases, so. But I thought this was kind of these, one of these interesting cases in terms of how, because of my desire to kind of maintain motion in this patient's neck kind of led me down this path of this, you know, uh, kind of hitting yourself over the head a couple times. You back up to sort of the sure. ones. So how far back here? Yeah, going back to sort of the original. If you can look at your original, even one more back. So when you look at when you're talking the fusion. So one of the things that I was sort of noticing, and I if you look, the superior facet, the front corner of it, hits on the inferior facet. If you look, there's that wonderful alignment, right? You just see this complete sort of you know, I, yeah, so if you're looking, you know, one of the points is this corner is always nice to look at, right? Yeah. Right? So now, take a look. So, I mean, it looks like you've almost overgapped it. I mean, and that was one of the things that, I, I mean, again, I think, you know, the MOBC is a great choice because it's a small implant. But it looks like that, you know, if you're comparing it on the, and then if you compare it, just look at the normal levels below. You almost always, so now if you go to the next slides, if you always look at the bottom levels of those normal ones, look at that corner. That corner is the sort of front part, right? That's the, and, and I think of it sort of almost, and you see it sort of in the same thing in the lumbar spine, you see it almost over. That front corner is giving you how much contact area there is in the facet joint. Now take a look at the other two with the MOBC, right? Yeah. And you can see that same corner. Now go to your later slides and take a look. If you keep going, 
and now go to the post-op when you've done your the fusion. Take a look at the one that still has the MOVC. You're still having that a large amount of uncovering. So what I would be suspicious of is that I, I think there's also an incompetent facet, but I think it's also the the question of whether or not that's just an overdistracted. Like I, I think I, what I worry about is that lack of uncovering. If you think about it from a biomechanical point of view, if you look at contact forces, right, your facet joints are now on the edges, right? You're sort of putting the very bottom part of the inferior facet of the top one is hitting just the front part of the superior facet. You're getting a yeah. rubbing on a very, sure. very, very small area of joint. And so I think, you know, that, that's one of the things that I was, I, and again, one of the things I wasn't so happy about the M6 was that sometimes it was hard to get them small enough. And, and it's one of the reasons I loved the Moby when it first came out was to get a four, but sometimes even that's a little too small. So I, I think one of the things to look at is then, and I was, was kind of looking at those, I see those, and when I've been seeing that, those are the ones that it's not just incompetent facet, it's also mechanically the posterior, the facet joints are now balancing on a tip instead of on the whole facet joint. Yeah, and again, I think what it goes back to is like, as we um, push the envelope in doing arthroplasty in patients who have severely spondylotic discs, if you can distract then kind of restore height anteriorly and that and yet you're not gapping your facet. So if you're not just doing this, I think doing arthroplasty is still not a bad idea. And I think you can get away with that. But if you so as long as you're doing this and your facet still have good contact, your capsule appears to be intact posteriorly. But if you you know, again, what I've learned from this case and kind of as I look at something like this into the future, I will likely end up fusing that level instead of doing arthroplasty because once you do this with your facet joints and you have no contact at that, you've effectively lost that doorstop that you need to keep that disc functioning the way it's designed to do so. So in a way, just like Scott said, or maybe it was Jack who said that that we ask too much for any disc to do to survive in this biomechanical environment. So, uh, I, this seems obvious now that I've heard it, but Pat Warden said this at NAS, and particularly, and at least Biden comment on this, particularly as it pertains to discs, arthroplasty, shear is not your friend. Yes. Clearly. <laughs> wait, wait, say it again. Hold your thoughts. We need to hear your voice. No. <laughs> I think the whole purpose of how we are evolved, the whole purpose of the facet joint is to stay compressed. It has to maintain that gap pressure and stay compressed. And when you over distract it through, um, well, in this situation with the disc implant, and are we oversizing the discs in their design work just to get them in, then you're compromising the facet just by distracting it even a small amount and opening that gap. Now it's not efficient in being able to resist extension and torsion. And we've seen it in other cases too, even in, in fusion cases when um, <clears throat> they're putting in and, and actually distracting when they're putting their pedicle screw systems in across the, the joint or, you know, it was a whole facet screw issue too in fusion cases early on where they'd over distract and then the, the screw would break. They're not meant to, they'd rather, they need to stay compressed for the most part okay, so that they can resist shear. We need the facet joint to function to some degree. We need to make sure that the facet joint's still contributing to right. that biomechanical segment because if the facet is kind of effectively destroyed, however you want to look at it, right, over distracted, then we're asking too much for that disc to do. And I think going back to Scott's yeah. comment, then you start dealing with a whole bunch of shear forces that the, the implant wasn't designed to deal with, you know? Yep. I think there's Thank also you. a mechanical issue, which is the facet joints. Use your microphone, Alexis, and, and then here. we're going to wrap up. Oh. Yeah, the facet joints are at 45 degrees. So one of the things to remember is that when you distract linearly a millimeter, you're distracting 1.4 millimeters across the joint. So it's a 45 degree angle. So one of the things is that, you know, if you if you just look at the mechanics, you lift it one millimeter, that's true, but what you're actually separating the joint by, and that everybody knows that when you park, park in an angled spot, it's a lot easier to park in, even if the sides are narrower. So one of the problems is you get away with that in some of the lower ones, but at the, those joints, that vertical separation is 40% larger in terms of the actual separation of the joint. So you're actually decreasing the contact forces by an enormous amount. So I think that's the other mechanics. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Ketchner, and thank you for uh, sharing. You know, it's always tough to show cases that uh, we struggle with, but um, as you can tell by the discussion, uh, those are the things we learn from. Um, so we're going to wrap up because we made that promise, and we have people in in uh, later time zones uh, who need to go to sleep. Uh, but tomorrow morning.